Okay, good afternoon um, and welcome to this keynote session uh, of the 6th World Bank, George Washington University and IDB Research Conference on Urbanization and Poverty Reduction. Uh, this session is on uh, moving to opportunity in the developing world. And I thought that when I looked at Leah's presentations, I would see lots of references to the Moving to Opportunity program in the US, but I didn't. So I'm sure she will, though, when she speaks, uh, uh, relate, the, re relate the two in some way. Uh, it's great to be here in Pennsylvania, on Pennsylvania Avenue talking about the benefits of migration. It's a topic of wide interest in this neighborhood. Uh, and I'm delighted that we're joined by uh, an amazing panel uh, uh, today. So giving the keynote address is Leah Boston, a professor of economics at Princeton University uh, and a research associate at the NBER, where she co-directs the development of the American Economy Program. Leah will speak in a moment for about half an hour. And then we have three distinguished panelists who will comment on the presentation and, and provide their own perspectives. Uh, Ingrid Gold Allen is the Paulette Goddard Professor of Urban Policy and Planning at the Robert Wagner Graduate School of Public Service at NYU, uh, where she's also the faculty director of the NYU Furman Center. Sumila Guliani, here immediately to my right, is a program leader for infrastructure and sustainable development in India. It's our World Bank's own uh, participant in this panel, has had a distinguished career here at the bank with us. And then uh, Nora Libertun de, de Duren is a senior specialist in the urban development and housing sector at the IADB where she leads the research and knowledge agenda. So delighted to have all four of you here. Thanks very much for coming. Over to Leah. Thank you, Chico, for that introduction, and to Harris and Remy and Juan Pablo for the invitation to address you today. Uh, let me say at the outset that I am not a development economist. I am an economic historian with a focus on the United States. But I would argue that the US offers an interesting template, or at least an analogy, for developing countries today. So in that spirit, I prepared these remarks. The topic is moving to opportunity in the developing world. And by that, I mean internal migration within developing countries, often from rural to urban areas, but not exclusively so. And I was inspired uh, to think about this topic uh, by a very thought-provoking piece by uh, our own Michael Clemens um, of the development community here in DC, uh, who argued that immigration could be considered development policy um, in the sense that simply by moving from a low wage to a high wage country, immigrants have the potential to increase their earnings sometimes two or three fold. And so he argued that with immigration restrictions, we leave trillion dollar bills on the sidewalk. I think that today in this climate, it's unlikely that developed countries are going to lessen their immigration restrictions um, and offer the opportunity to elevate lives for the potentially billion people who are, have expressed interest in moving from developing countries to the developed world. And so instead, uh, what I wanted to ask today is how many dollar bills do we leave on the table uh, from the inefficiently low internal migration within developing countries themselves, which is a place where we potentially have scope for more policy action. So I'd like to ask, are there too few people migrating from rural to urban areas today? Are people stuck in the wrong city? And can we use policy to help move people to better locations? So how do we know that we may have inefficiently low internal migration? One way of assessing the idea of inefficiently low migration is to notice that there are relatively low mobility rates in many developing countries, despite 
large wage gaps between locations. So in a recent paper in the Journal of Political Economy, Brian and Morton used a structural model to deduce the following conclusion. They say, on average, migrants in Indonesia must be compensated with around a 40% increase in income in order to move, whereas in the United States, moves require only a 15% potential increase in earnings. This conclusion suggests that there are barriers to mobility, though it does not provide the channels or mechanisms for what those barriers might be. Um, some of the people in the room, um, the Cohn et al. Uh, paper referenced here, as well as Kaivin Munshi and Mark Rosenzweig, have suggested a variety of potential barriers, including family ties and informal social insurance that takes place within a rural village context, potentially a lack of information about wage opportunities in cities, credit constraints that might make it challenging to gather enough resources to make a move, and so on. Despite these barriers, there has been substantial urbanization in developing countries. And so to put this into context, I wanted to compare the urbanization rate over the past 60 years or so to a similar such rate in the United States during a similar period of development. So this graph works on two axes. On the bottom axis, um, the time scale starts at, in 1860. And on the top axis, the scale begins in 1960. And I chose those dates to find a time in which the urbanization rate in the United States was similar to the urbanization rate in developing countries using World Bank data on low and middle income countries in the year 1960. So in this period, 20% of residents in the developing world uh, lived in an urban area. And that was similar in the United States in 1860. And then over the next 50 or 60 years, urbanization uh, increased so that now 50% of residents in those countries, as well as in the US in the year 1920, uh, live in an urban area. So by this metric, it suggests that maybe um, internal migration is just proceeding apace that the US and developing countries were urbanizing at a similar rate. Though I would argue that underlying this similarity um, does lie the potential for inefficiency in the sense that today we have dramatic expansion in transportation technology and in communication technology that would make it potentially more lucrative to move to a city. So the US experienced this level of urbanization without the automobile or the truck or bus, except at the very last decade um, of the time series, um, without many paved roads, um, and without the kind of computerization or communication technology that now um, increases dramatically the return to living in a city. And so what looks like similarity might actually also suggest inefficiency low, inefficiently low urbanization. Uh, so for the rest of my time, I want to consider uh, two uh, issues. The first is, what do the estimates look like for the economic return to internal migration? Is there an economic benefit to residents of a country that move from one location to another. Often this will be a rural to urban move, though not always. And I want to present evidence both from history as well as from contemporary work. And then I want to ask what policies could we use to encourage this migration? If the returns are there and there are dollar bills on the table, how do we access them? So let me start with an episode that I spent some time working on myself, which was the migration from rural areas in the US South to industrial cities in the North and West. Uh, this was a migration that took place over around a 60 year period from 1910 to 1970. Um, and around 10 million migrants participated in this episode, both white migrants and black migrants leaving the South. Uh, many of these migrants actually settled here in DC. Um, so it has a special resonance for our conference today. 
We can see here an image of a family taking part in that um, mi migration episode. And here, the family has packed all of their belongings into a car and is moving along um, an unpaved road in the US, um, though many of the migrants uh, would have engaged in this journey by train or by bus. So what are the benefits of participating in this rural to urban migration in the United States? I asked this question first in a very simple way and then with a slightly more complicated empirical approach. The simple approach is just take every person in the US Census who reports being born in the South and then look at those people in adulthood, some of whom uh, will have since moved to the north or west, and some of, of, of whom will have remained in the south, and compare the earnings of migrants to the earnings of stayers. And what you find there is illustrated in the black bars on the image for black migrants on the left-hand side and for white migrants on the right-hand side. You see that Southern-born men who live somewhere else in the country during adulthood have doubled their earnings relative to stairs um, for black migrants and have increased their earnings by 50% uh, for white migrants. One concern with thinking about estimating the return to both internal or international migration is who chooses to move. Is it the most talented, entrepreneurial, persistent people who make the move? And so to address that selection, at least partially, I compared brothers who were living in the same household during childhood, one of whom moved to the north and one of whom stayed in the south using census linking approaches. And there I find very similar estimates. So it seems like what's going on in this context, in the context of a mass migration, which was not very selective, um, was indeed uh, a return, a causal return to leaving the South. Today there's a lot of discussion about rural areas in the US um, as sites of low opportunity. Um, so here's an image from a recent Wall Street Journal article uh, depicting uh, a shuttered factory in rural Ohio. Um, and the suggestion has often been that mo mobility would be an option to an urban area in the US. We've already seen um, some evidence on, on this topic from Diego's keynote earlier. Um, being very careful, thinking about um, using not just individual fixed effects, looking at people before and after their move, but also thinking about accumulated experience. To the best of my knowledge, we don't have such detailed information for the US, um, but I wanted to reference um, an earlier paper by Ed Glazer, who is here today and co-author uh, using panel data, following individuals before and after they moved from a rural area to an urban area in the US in the contemporary period. This data would be mostly from the 1980s, and they find that there's still scope for returns today um, on the order of around 5 or 10% increase in earnings. Much smaller than what I was finding earlier in the US development process, um, but still there's scope for potential uh, returns from internal migration to cities in the US today. What about in developing country context? What do we know about the return to internal migration? There are two recent papers that have used experimental techniques to induce migration from rural setting into cities. The first such paper provided information about wage earning opportunities. This was in the context of Kenya, um, focusing on wages that could be earned in Nairobi. This is work by Travis Bassler. Um, and he found that providing information uh, did induce migration. So this is something we can come back to at the end of the talk when talking about possible policy solutions. And that those participants in the study who were induced to migrate earned 160% more than residents who stayed put. This is very much on order with what I was finding in the US development process for migrants who moved somewhere between 1920 and 1940 from the US South. In, a, in a, a different experiment that was focused on seasonal migration, Brian, Chowdhury, and Mubarak provided small migration grants or loans to encourage migration um, to cities 
uh, for a seasonal period. And I'm illustrating this here with an image of a rickshaw driver because many of the migrants who participate in this seasonal migration work as rickshaw drivers in the city. They found that a small travel incentive encouraged seasonal migration, and those participants in the study that were induced to migrate increased consumption for themselves and for their households by 30%. Finally, I also want to point uh, to another source of information about uh, the return to internal migration. Without the opportunity to do a randomized control trial or to induce migration on your own experimentally, you also can look to natural experiments in history that have forced migrations to take place. This can happen during natural disasters or during other political events that require someone to move from one location to another. There's a growing, small but growing literature on this topic, um, which seems to now be showing that even displacement can have unexpected positive effects on earnings over the long run. And speculation that the reason why this takes place is that people often have strong ties to a place. Those can be because of family connections in a place of birth, for example. So even when a location is unproductive or does not provide a good match for an individual's skills, they may remain in that location uh, and not take the opportunity to move. So a forced migration might end up being positive down the line. So let me uh, talk about two recent papers on this topic. And the first um, is the result of a brutal an unjust episode in the United States, which was the internment of over 100,000 Japanese Americans during World War II. This was a short run episode taking place in the early 1940s um, and ending by 1945. Uh, this image here is a picture from Dorothea Lang, uh, which was taken um, in one of the 10 internment camps that was set up in the United States, mostly in the Pacific um, and mountain states. So in a recent paper, Jaime Ariano Bove has compared likely Japanese internees to two control groups. Uh, one group are Chinese Americans, and the other are likely non-intern Japanese. Um, and this is just by virtue of state of birth that the interned Japanese tended to be um, resident of California, uh, Washington State, and Oregon, and other places in the West, whereas the small population of Japanese Americans that lived on the East Coast were not put in camps. And what he finds is that by 1960, the Japanese who, were, who had experienced internment, or likely did, um, had 10% higher annual income and were eight percentage points more likely to switch occupation, often away from farming into a white collar position. And he speculates that one reason why this may have taken place is that before internment, uh, Japanese Americans, like many people around the world, lived in pretty segregated environments, that they lived with other people uh, from the same class position. In the camps, everyone lived together, and so he describes how in a typical block uh, might contain families of well-to-do farmers, itinerant farm laborers, shopkeepers, a dentist, etc. And so through these connections, and, and uh, labor market networks could form. Another such example of forced migration is uh, uh, the outcome of the Eldfell eruption of 1973, which was a volcanic eruption off the coast of Iceland. And this was the subject of a recent paper by Nakamura, Sigurdsson, and Steinson uh, following the, um, the victims of this natural disaster uh, through more than 30 years of detailed administrative records. What they find is that the volcano destroyed around 30% of the homes in this small but wealthy fishing town that was affected. If your home was destroyed, you, you yourself were 50% more likely to move. And so having a home destroyed in the event was the forcing factor that induced some people to move and not others. They find that young workers that were induced to move after this event earned a 50% return. They had 50% higher income later in life. And we can see the distribution of these returns in the graph on the right-hand side um, by quantile of the income distribution so that the majority of those induced to move um, 
increased their earnings by around 20,000 US dollars, and that's around the 50% return. But there was a small group above the, t the top 10% that had very high returns for migration. Um, and this is migration away from a wealthy area, but an area that was dependent on natural resources and did not have many opportunities for white collar, urban style positions. And so they argue that this distribution of returns is suggestive of mismatch of skills that don't match your location and potential comparative advantage in other locations. So I think that the evidence is compelling that internal migration, while perhaps not generating the type of returns one could expect from international border crossing, itself also contains very high uh, potential economic returns. And we could think of uh, internal migration as development policy as well. So how would we use policy to induce or influence migration? I want to talk about three options. Um, the first is widespread governmental resettlement programs. And I want to talk about this option uh, because we should acknowledge that it's been tried many times in the past. There have been studies that have evaluated uh, these kinds of programs. And typically, these studies uh, tend to have cautionary tales about problems that can emerge with centralized, large-scale re relocations. And I want to bring up the idea of small upfront nudges to in, in, induce individuals to move, um, and then uh, just um, touch on the idea of eliminating institutional barriers to movement. Um, so there's a, a bit of new work on this um, possibility in developing uh, country context, but I think this might be a, new, a place for uh, very fruitful new research. In terms of widespread resettlement, um, there are a number of concerns I want to highlight up front. Um, the first is that such large programs may require coercion in order to be successful, or large payments to move large numbers of people. Um, and so there's a bit of a tension here. I started at the beginning of the talk by saying uh, that people might be inefficiently located. And in that case, just providing a little bit of upfront assistance might be enough to encourage people to move from one location to another. Uh, and that might be true for households that are on the margin between staying and leaving. But there's a large set of inframarginal households that might require very large payments. Um, and that is what ends up happening in some of the uh, policies that have been studied. In addition, centralized decision making about location choice may ignore factors that individual households would take into account, like skill match between the household and the location, and like the potential importance of having community networks, family or ethnic group communities that would facilitate integration into a new location. In addition, large scale relocations can have negative spillovers that one would need to think about in designing such policies. So let me talk about two or three such programs. Um, the first is the Indonesian Transmigration Program that began under Dutch colonial rule, but was revived under independence and peaked in the early 80s. Uh, this was a program that settled over 2 million migrants from Java, uh, the most uh, populated, um, and it was argued overcrowded location in the Indonesian archipelago to some of the outlying islands. Uh, this program was recently studied by a quartet of economists. Um, and I would see the upshot of their finding um, as pointing out um, one of these cautionary tales. They do report that 82% per of participants reported having higher income or equal income after the migration. But they argue that skill match between the individual household and the ultimate location choice um, was essential for success. So migrants that were settled in areas with a similar agroclimate to the location from which they were leaving performed much better. Um, and they, uh, to give you a sense of the magnitude of this importance, they argue that a one standard deviation increase in agroclimatic similarity is associated with a 20% increase in household productivity and a two percentage point increase in nighttime lights, um, which we've seen already is one measurement of area development. Another such widespread relocation policy is something that development economists might not think about much, um, but is actually a policy that's still very much in place um, in some Nordic and uh, 
northern European countries, and that is refugee assignment location that began in Sweden and Denmark, but is now also in place in the Netherlands and other countries. This program began in the 1980s when migration from the Middle East uh, started to pick up in European context. And the concern was that migrants were settling all in Copenhagen um, and Stockholm and that migrant neighborhoods were becoming overcrowded. And so instead, migrants were assigned to locations around the country, uh, some smaller cities, some village settings. Economists have studied these programs, and from the study of the assignment location have learned that being assigned to a location with others from your home community matters quite a bit, and that's something that the government did not take into account. Um, so let me just um, give you uh, an overview of three such studies. Uh, the two on the left-hand side both take earnings as their outcome, and then the third takes student GPA as an outcome. So to begin with, each one of these papers starts by just looking at um, realized location, not assignment by the government. So where do immigrants themselves choose to live? Um, and they compare immigrants who live in areas with large numbers from their own home country versus smaller numbers from their own home country. So do you live in an enclave or do you live in a more integrated neighborhood? And immigrants who live in an enclave, you can see, earn less around 5% less for a one standard deviation change in residents from the home community. Those are the black bars that are below the line. However, if you take the assignment location and say where did the government assign you to live, immigrants who are assigned to live in areas with others from their home community earn a lot more. And what we learn from this is that it's the immigrants who need the most help that are choosing on their own to live in an enclave. We cannot infer from the choices themselves that the enclave is bad for earnings. In fact, if we focus only on the random assignment from these two countries, Denmark and Sweden, that did the allocation randomly, you can see that living with others from your home community is actually quite positive for earnings. So as a centralized planner who's deciding we need to relocate people from inefficient locations, maybe into cities, or into more growing areas, if you don't take into account skill match and if you don't take into account these community networks, the program can go awry. So I want to um, introduce uh, some of my own work on this topic uh, for a program that I think of as sitting between re resettlement and centralized decision making and nudges, which allow individuals to make their own choices. And this program was called the Industrial Removal Office. It was not a government program. It was a self-help program um, put together by the Jewish community in the early 20th century in New York City with a similar focus. The Lower East Side, which was the Jewish enclave at the time, and here you can see an image of Orchard Street, which was one of the streets in the Lower East Side neighborhood, was overcrowded. Public health conditions were poor, job opportunities had a lot of competition, and so the community thought we should relocate residents out of New York to 200 cities and towns around the country. The program operated on a nudge type of basis. It provided only funding for a train ticket and a small initial stipend for a month so that you could find a place to live and find a job. But it also operate, operated as a centralized decision-making program where you did not get to choose where in the country you moved. They would assign you to Cincinnati or Los Angeles or Denver, and they would provide a train ticket to that location. So it turns out that the nudge component of the program worked quite well, but the centralized decision-making did not. So in terms of thinking about the nudge, here I'm just comparing uh, a control group of Jewish residents of the Lower East Side in the gray bar who were not incentivized to leave New York to participants in this IRO program who also lived in the Lower East Side, were also Jewish, but they were given a small train ticket amount of funding to leave the city. And you can see that 60% of those incentivized to leave did so. However, in terms of moving to the assignment location, if you follow these residents around eight years after their 
um, migra their mig initial migration, only 10% of them are still living in their assigned location. So they're not moving back to New York City, but they're not necessarily staying in Cincinnati if that's not the best location for them. By the way, for comparison, if we think about the Bangladesh program that I mentioned, um, those uh, village residents that were not incentivized to move to uh, the city on a seasonal basis, around 30% of them did do so on their own compared to around 60% that were incentivized to do so. So the similarity in the estimates of how a nudge might work are really striking. And then finally, what happened to the households that were induced to leave New York City? Well, you see on the left-hand side that these residents earned a lot less at baseline. So in 1910, before they were moved, they earned around 10% less than the comparison group, and those are the black bars here. The gray bars refer to um, pr program participants who left New York and stayed outside of New York, and they were similarly selected. And then, 10 years later, what happened to them? Well, much of the disadvantage has been erased overall, and if you focus in on the group that stayed outside of New York, um, they are now earning 3 or 4% more. So leaving New York was, again, a nudge that worked in terms of increasing income, and we see that there's at least some persistence on to the children's generation. So. <clears throat> Both the work from uh, the IRO program in history and also uh, the experiments I mentioned in Bangladesh and in Kenya suggest that sm small nudges can work. In Bangladesh, uh, the program provided only around a $9 grant, which was equivalent of 3% of annual earnings, very similar to the IRO program, and increased migration by 60%. In Kenya, uh, simply provided information um, and increased migration by 40%. However, in Bangladesh, providing information did not help. Um, why the difference? Well, it could be that a seasonal migration that takes place every year already confers a lot of information back to the village. People already know what the wage opportunities are and maybe face credit constraints in that context in order to participate. So finally, um, I also want to raise the possibility that government policy can build substantial barriers to migration in some contexts. So rather than provide nudges to individual households, uh, we could think as policymakers about reducing these barriers to mobility. Uh, these can include uh, zoning laws, housing supply restrictions, and building permits, or in some cases, particularly in former communist countries, um, they can include uh, direct um, control over internal migration. So here you see the case of the huko in China, where in order to live in a particular city, you need to have registration to do so. Um, so the final paper I'll talk about is a paper thinking about what happens when you remove huko from some cities. Um, does that increase rural to urban migration? And the answer is yes. So this paper compares rural residents with access to these deregulated cities where you could move without registration to rural residents that don't. I mean, in theory, a rural resident has access to any city, but of course we know that through migration networks, rural residents are more likely to go to one location versus another. And here the paper uses migration networks that were established during an earlier period, a period of the sent down youth, when urban residents were forced to live in rural areas for a few years. Um, and the paper finds that increasing these networks increases the probability of migration after the HUCO reform. And so before the reform, uh, this, these migration opportunities are closed down, but after the HUCO reform, migration increases by around one percentage point on a basis of 16%. And then they follow up the households to find that those who have an urban migrant in the household um, have a number of advantages. So let me conclude my remarks and uh, uh, move on to our panel discussion by saying that uh, the evidence is really overwhelming that there are high returns to internal migration. Because these returns are high, sometimes a nudge is enough. There are households that are interested in participating already um, and may simply just lack the initial seed money to participate. From history, we can see that the central determination of which locations migrants should move to um, can often be infeasible. And so the goal is finding situations where a small nudge can help people choose their own optimal location, uh, taking into account their own skill mix um, and uh, their own community networks. Thank you. <laughs>
thank you very much, Leo, for that very stimulating, very rich and clear uh, presentation. So we'll now move to the debate amongst our, uh, our panelists. The organizers um, provided the panelists with a set of three questions uh, to comment on, which were basically around the forces driving or constraining migration to cities and or residential choices within cities. So the, the causes of these things, forces driving or constraining that mobility, then the consequences, social or economic implications of those, and then possible policy responses to those. So those three will be kind of in the background, but what I'd like to ask the panelists to do is just have that in the background as a framing uh, device to offer your comments on, on what Leah said or your own perspectives on, on these issues. And I've asked the panelists to speak for no more than five minutes, so I'll wave at you if you're uh, at that mark. Let's start with Ingrid, please. This button? Okay, can you hear me? Okay, great. So good afternoon. Um, and Leah, thank you for that fantastic keynote. That was really terrific. Um, I, um, I'm going to sort of apologize up front, but just saying like I do, my work is in, is very much in the U.S. context, so I feel self-conscious coming to the World Bank and talking about the U.S., but, um, and a lot of my work is on migration really within cities across neighborhoods, I'm just going to say that sort of that that's a little bit the perspective I come from. Now, obviously in the U.S., um, we are a country with, and Leah sort of referenced this, that there are higher levels of urbanization and higher levels of, of mobility than many countries around the world. That said, we have seen a pretty dramatic decline in mobility uh, in the United States over the last few decades. So in 1985, um, one in five U.S. residents changed homes. In 2018, fewer than one in ten. U.S. residents changed homes, and actually making 2018 had the lowest recorded level of, of um, residential mobility since the since 1948, when the census actually first started recording tracking residential mobility. And and what's interesting is this is sort of across the board. You look at any subgroup. You look by race. You look by gender. You look by age. You look by income. You look by ownership status. Everybody is moving less. Okay, and. And it's not clear, which I think Leah, Leah's talk really um, underscored, it's not clear whether this is necessarily a bad thing, right? It's very difficult to know what, what's the sort of efficiently, right? What's the efficient level of, of migration? Um, and interestingly, I mean, most of my work is on housing policy where I feel like the obsession is how to keep people in their homes. And then, you know, talking to labor economists, it's all about letting people move from their homes. So obviously there are some trade-offs, right? Moving is disruptive. People may have strong community attachments. There's some evidence that in the U.S. that households are becoming more rooted in place as we've sort of spread out and settled in. Um, and But I think that some of the decline in mobility in the U.S. I think is likely due to um, growing constraints and particularly um, for uh, um, low, low, lower skilled workers um, who are not only less likely to move overall, but they're, they're very um, rarely move to, to, to sort of high wage, to high wage areas. Um, and so you see very few moves of, of low income and, and, uh, and, and less educated workers from, from low wage areas to high wage areas within the U.S. Um, and, and I think a key constraint, there, there are many factors here, but a key constraint may be um, housing markets and particularly high housing costs and land use regulations that are locking a lot of um, lower skilled workers out of um, higher opportunity um, and, and more productive places. Um, I think in, there are also information, there continue to be information gaps. I think there continues to be discrimination, which constrains and, and increases. It, it may not, you know, as dramatically shape uh, choice, the choice set and constrain the choice set as it did several years ago, but it is still true that it raises search costs both for um, families of color, but also for um, households with rental subsidies. And, and, and I think that these, importantly, these constraints seem to be um, blocking some moves, um, as sort of Leah suggests, that, that could be um, uh, beneficial, if, at least for the children, if not for the parents. And that's something else that I do want to sort of underscore my perspective. I think very much today we've been talking about how mobility affects workers and affects the, the current generation. But my work is very much focused on sort of kids and sort of that, 
that next generation. Um, and and we have um, you know you you didn't mention MTO, but um, but certainly we have strong evidence from the Moving to Opportunity program in this country that um, low-income families who are given uh, children, young children who, uh, in low-income families um, who receive a, a housing subsidy and move to a lower poverty neighborhood are more likely to go to college. They have higher earnings. Um, Etc. And um, and so and and I think that there is um, there's there's also evidence that we're sort of seeing increasing segregation by skills in this country. And I and I think that there is um, evidence that that's you know that plenty of evidence that that's problematic. I think interestingly, I'll just raise one point, just sort of on the on the political side, which is that I think. As we have seen, as skills segregation has grown, it's so it seems has political segregation, which may, there's some political scientists who think this may be um, further sort of polarizing political life in this country. So you think about it, if you sort of, if you live nearby people who come from different backgrounds who disagree with you, you're more likely to learn to listen and engage with them, whereas if they're in another part of the country, you might just, it's easier to sort of distance them. and. And, and even demonize them. So, so, so what do we do about this? I mean, I think Leah set up a really nice framework in terms of sort of the policy list. I mean, I, you know, I, I don't think in this country where, um, well, who knows, but whether, actually, I should not say that. I was about to say we're not going to see widespread government resettlement, but I take that back. Um, so, um, but I think that, so there is widespread government resettlement. Um, I think there are, uh, they're sort of removing barriers, right, to, to, to moving, which I think is sort of the, the lowest level. Sort of there's, there's providing information, and then there's providing incentives. And, and I think that certainly removing barriers to mobility and, um, and integration, um, you know, combating discrimination and, and, and working to reduce exclusionary zoning um, clearly is, uh, those are going to be efficient, those efforts. I think it's also likely to be efficient to provide information to just encourage households to consider a broader array of neighborhoods. I think the trickier question, and Leah talked about this, right, is is the incentives. And I think the key there is that how, what's, what's the price of those incentives? So I think that if it, you know, we know that children who, who grow up in lower poverty environments do better later in life, but if you tell me, if you, if I told you that the cost of, of enabling that family to move to the to the uh, higher income area was five times the cost of providing a housing subsidy for them in the low income area, you might say that's inefficient. But surely there must be sort of some level of subsidy for which we'd be, we should be willing to pay some level of premium to help that family move to to a lower income to a sorry, lower poverty or a higher income area that offers more resources and opportunities for their children. Thanks. Thank you, Ingrid. So before I move to Nora, I should have actually said that um, after the panel, I'll, ask, uh, I'll give Leah an opportunity to, to respond briefly if she wants to, and then I'll turn to you. So please make sure you're uh, getting your questions and comments ready for, for Leah, but also for other panelists, if you like. Thanks. Nora? Um, hello, and thank you. Thank you for the presentation, Leah and, and Ingrid, for, for framing this within the U.S. And I would like to do the same for the Latin American and Caribbean region. And something to underscore is that the region, as you all know well, has been, it's highly urban and has been urbanized for more than 40 years, 50 years. And what we see is migration among cities, not rural to urban migration, and within cities. And that's kind of... Um, frame the kind of households that we see moving. And it's also coming, calling into question what's happening with urbanization. And in that regard, I would like to, to go back to the presentation. And the question is, um, which are the characteristics of the households that are moving? And do we have the classic framework, the push and pull factors. I, I'm sure that you are all familiar with that. But what we are seeing is the, the typical ones, the economy and the violence are still there, but we also have other issues on the table. Um, more and more we'll see the environmental as one of the forces moving people. We are not prepared for that yet, but that's likely to come, having people move from one location to the other because of lack or excess of water, for example. And the other thing, it's the, the issue of the quality of life or congestion or transportation and how, what is the role of infrastructure. 
Another thing that I would like to put on the table is the composition of the households. What we are seeing in the region, especially in the last 20 years, is that not only we have more, uh, a higher proportion of the population um, exceeding, uh, becoming elders and, and, and families that are smaller at the same time, but also more families are being led by women. And what we learn is that Households that are led by women have a different uh, priorities in terms of choosing their location. So the provision of services that they will choose, the bundle of services that they will prioritize is different. And that ends up affecting their locational choices. For example, we have seen many cases of housing policies that promote access to housing and um, failing because they are not promoting access to services, which is what the majority of households led by women are uh, choosing. Uh, by that I mean having access to daycare, to transportation, to social networks. So that's something to consider in terms of what is a barrier, and that the question is for whom that's a barrier. And then another thing that I would like to, to, to bring here is uh, when we do study migrants, we do not study those who are left behind. And that's an important question. Like, we know that, uh, for example, a migrant is likely to increase his or her income. But what happened with those who are left in the same locality? What happened with the infrastructure that is left in place? What happened with the households that are left in place? And the reason why I say that is because um, what we have seen in, in many countries in Latin America, um, Argentina, but also you know, uh, Brazil, even Chile, Colombia, Mexico, it's a higher concentration of the population in fewer places. And, and that does create economies of agglomeration if you do have the right technology, but you also wonder what is happening with the other locations. And that's something to, to Restudy, and I would like to see a study not only of those who did take the program, but also who did not accept those nudges, and the locations, and what's the overall effect in the national development and in the households themselves. Great. Thanks, Nora. Samila? Great. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here with this uh, panel. I really, thank you for all your excellent remarks. Um, so uh, when we were invited here, it said this panel was going to debate, but we haven't had any debate. It seems like we are completely aligned. So let me step back and start with what Chico said. So today we've been debating, or not de discussing, the returns to migration and how they are significant. So Leah uh, presented th those data, Diego set, showed how it is uh, better to move from one smaller city to medium-sized city to a larger city in S Spain and quantified the benefits uh, of these moves. But this kind of um, technical estimation of the benefits, the economic benefits of movement, is uh, seemingly running right in the face of the political discourse, both internationally and nationally, in many places. So as Chico said, we love migration in DC right now, and you all know what that means. And even though the discussion today is about migration within countries, some of that discourse is not different. So I'm, I'm Indian, but I hadn't lived and worked in India for many, many years, over a quarter century, and I'm now working on India after this big gap. And um, so internal migration in India, I don't know what would be internal. It's a country of 1.3 billion, where some of the states are bigger than countries. So our biggest state in terms of population is, is Uttar Pradesh, and it has 225 million people, which is the same population, no, slightly larger than Brazil. So the, uh, there are language barriers, there are culture barriers, uh, transportation is still not fantastic, it's improving. And there are lots of barriers in there, and there's a different kind of political discourse there that we need to understand. So the point I'm trying to make is, I think everybody in this room seems to agree that there seems to be returns to migration. Very often, if not always, those benefits exceed costs, and yet we see too little. And some of that may be political, some of it might be social, and yet others might just be things like lack of information. So I just want to put that uh, first point on the table. 
Um, so the second thing that I want to talk about is uh, a lot of us focus on individuals and households, right? So what would it take in terms of information or a nudge to get a household to move? And I would like to uh, urge all of us to think about the institutions that create the barriers or facilitate the reduction of barriers. So I think uh, Leah just uh, referred to a paper on India by Cohn and others, uh, uh, 2017, but it uses 2001 census data from India because India only just released the census data from 2011. So the data are constrained, and we're talking about 2001, but what they found was there were invisible walls, and those invisible walls followed exactly state boundaries. And they conclude that the reason, so what they were finding is that if you were in two neighboring districts, your um, likelihood of moving was 50% higher than if you were in two neighboring districts divided by a state border. Right? And so their um, guess or their uh, argument is that this is because social benefits are state-based as opposed to na national, and these don't transport easily across borders. Uh, and I think there's other research coming out that looks at it more politically, and it's finding that actually hiring uh, policies of governments and even private firms are biased towards their people or people from their home state. So an example to this is very interesting. So I oversee a very large, uh, I get to see a very large number of projects across um, sectors, and we were looking at a dam safety project, uh, which works in multiple states in India, and it's taken forever to implement this project. And we were trying to talk to the team about why this project isn't moving faster. So they say, look, in this particular state, for example, there are only two firms that do grouting that can help improve the safety of those dams. So they have to finish one work site and go to the next. I said, but we are a country of 1.3 billion people. There must be contractors elsewhere. And that person just looked at me like I'm an alien and said, but they're going to only hire people from that state, and they're only these two firms. And obviously, they do other things to prevent other people from that state creating firms that can do grouting. So there are lots of invisible barriers in terms of how hiring happens in private firms, how contracts are awarded, uh, and uh, explicit bias in uh, state government hiring, which is a pretty large set of formal hiring that happens in India that's targeted towards people from that state. So these are some of the um, uh, institutional barriers. So one of them are these state policies, st uh, state programs, and um, ration cards uh, that the uh, program was talking about. And yet another argument that's come from a paper in 2019, I think it was, um, uh, uh, I forget the name, uh, and they were talking that actually political decentralization has led to greater focus on giving um, benefits and favors to the local population, however you define it, and trying to exclude aliens or actually defining people who are not from there as aliens who are uh, you know, contesting for scarce jobs and scarce resources. So this is where the institutions and the political discourse sort of come together to create barriers, and it would be very nice to uh, do some research on that. Both of my colleagues have mentioned housing and services. Uh, so one of the visible um, uh, manifestations of internal migration in rapidly urbanizing countries like India and other countries in Africa is the emergence of slums, and these turn out to be segregated neighborhoods that are underserved, both physically and through social services, have poor uh, transportation networks, often connecting them to jobs and things like that. Um, and the, uh, I would just mention very briefly two other kinds of institutions that are worth studying. One is these recruiters who go to rural areas or other towns to help people move. Uh, trying to help employers hire, and those practices. There's a very rich literature in international migration that I think needs to be replicated in internal migration discussion and labor laws and how they vary uh, internally in a country as well. Um, the final thing that I'd like to say is that uh, we were asked to talk about policies that would facilitate. And all I want to say is uh, we can have that discussion as the floor is opened, but moving to opportunity that's been very powerfully demonstrated in the US, I suspect maybe more of a US solution. 
Uh, by that I mean that if we compare um, segregated neighborhoods in the US that are poorly served versus poorly served slum neighborhoods in places like India and Kenya and other places, you have other solutions like upgrading those neighborhoods and connecting them better to the city, and these have developed very nicely over time when the right things have been done, rather than just giving vouchers to these people to move to other neighborhoods. So as infrastructure is growing in these cities, there is a need to do inclusionary infrastructure provision and service delivery to integrate the city as opposed to just create divided uh, neighborhoods. I'll stop there, and hopefully there'll be a chance to discuss with all of you. Thanks. Thanks, Samila. Um, so as, although it's probably true that there hasn't been sort of violent disagreement in the panel, there has been a wide range of, of, of perspectives, and, and both both um, thematically and, and regionally. So I'd like now to um, go to Leah again. But just before I do, to abuse my, my position as the chair, I'll ask three quick questions uh, of my own. Uh, that's the kind of reward you get when you, if you have to get out of your office and chair something, you get to ask questions to the speaker. So uh, three just very sort of narrow, uh, relatively narrow questions, but things that came to my mind as I listened to the sort of very nice review of the literature on uh, wage, income, and consumption estimates of wage, income, and consumption gains to migration. One is, um, to what extent are these different papers able to control for uh, spatial differences in cost of living, which is obviously a, a key concern, particularly in developing countries, and particularly with regard to housing costs. Um, a second one is, uh, um, I think it was Ingrid who did mention the, the US, uh, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, MTO uh, program that was evaluated. Uh, and it, 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 that evaluation, of course, as most people in the room will know, Focus on lots of different right-hand side, uh, sorry, left-hand side variables. Not not just wages and earnings, but health, mental health, uh, education outcomes for children, and so on and so forth. Is there any work on that in this literature on developing countries? And 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 kind of on the side of that a little bit, you know, people do nowadays take subjective well-being and happiness seriously. Is there any work looking at the happiness of uh, migrants? Um, you know, has that gone up by as much? as their income. Uh, and the final question is, you know, I always, I'm not, as you can probably tell, an urban economist. But when I think of urban economics, I think of uh, uh, externalities, right? Agglomeration ones on the one hand and congestion ones on the other. So in, in this discipline, are private benefits enough to say anything about the social benefits of migration? Perhaps many of the skeptics of migration, whether internal or external, would say there are large negative externalities from moving these people from Stockholm to my little village in Sweden, or from moving you know, large numbers of people from rural areas to slums where there is no sanitation or security, and so on and so forth. So is there any work? Obviously, I understand methodologically very, very hard to estimate those things, but what's the thinking on the um, externalities uh, and, and social benefits relative to private. So with that, Leah, there's a lot on this panel. Don't feel like you have to answer everything. Uh, it's cover whatever you want, and then we'll go to the, to the audience. Thanks. So thanks to everyone for such fruitful discussion and raising so many issues. Um, I. I just want to list a few things that hopefully we'll be able to discuss further uh, with questions from the floor. Uh, the first is um, the topic that Ingrid brought up about children and second generation benefits. Um, I want to mention that there have been a few papers on this topic um, focusing on the great black migration from the south. Um, a series of papers looking at health consequences, both for the migrants themselves and for the infants that were born in the North. And in both of those cases, the health costs of migration were severe. So even though earnings increased in the North, that was somewhat at the expense of health um, in cities in the US that at the time um, were particularly dirty and subject to infectious disease and also uh, provided opportunities for purchasing things like alcohol and tobacco that had long-run health consequences. 
There's also the work by Alora Derenencourt um, as a working paper uh, looking at children who grew up in high great black migration cities and found that particularly for black men, uh, there were negative consequences for growing up in cities uh, that had had um, large flows of black migrants um, in the previous generation, and then thinking about some of the mechanisms for that. I think this um, gets to Chico's point about externalities um, and some of the responses of existing residents to inflows. One of the responses was particularly uh, spending money on policing and incarceration. Uh, the second thing I want to bring up beyond children um, uh, was from Nora's comments um, about sending areas. So that's something we haven't talked about at all. Uh, but again, there, there's some really growing uh, work on this topic as well. So I'm sort of trying to highlight places where there's a lot of new research. Um, I think uh, until recently, the only work was, that was being done was on the wage benefits of this from the sending region. So if you lose a lot of migrants to the city, that means fewer workers in rural areas and potentially increased earnings for people who remain, uh, who don't have to compete with as many in the labor force. And then recently, there's been some uh, new work on some of the political effects in sending areas, um, either of getting information flows from the city or from the destination that might create political change, or uh, by empowering low-skilled or low-earnings uh, individuals in sending areas as wages are rising, they may also get additional uh, political gains. Um, the third thing I want to bring up um, from Samila's points about institutional barriers, so I had only mentioned uh, zoning, construction, building permits, um, things that have to do with the housing market. And Sumila uh, rightly brought up all sorts of labor market policies that may make it challenging to find a job in a new state or new location. Um, and so this brings to mind for me debates about occupational licensing um, in the US uh, and um, I think in other uh, developing country contexts as well um, that make it difficult to move from one location to another. Um, so I think we have actually touched a bit on externalities um, as well as um, other outcomes, which health is one, that's very important. I don't know um, much in the historical context about mental health or subjective well-being, though of course that might be something that some of you in the audience know from uh, contemporary work. And then finally, cost of living. Um, any of the studies that I referenced where re returns were greater than 100% on earnings, um, I think we can be very safe in saying that uh, those returns were also real. So in nominal terms, 100% or more um, increase in earnings. In real terms, probably less than that because of cost of living. But remember that housing is the major um, item that's going to vary in price across location and is usually around 30% of budget. So even if housing is also twice as expensive in the city, when you get earnings um, gains of uh, double or more, even if your housing uh, costs go up by that amount, you're still going to be in the realm of, um, of, of a real return. Um, some of the other uh, estimates that were a bit lower than that indeed might not really be uh, providing real gains, but I think since many of these estimates are just strikingly large, they probably are also um, going to be reflective of real returns. Thank you very much, Leah. So now it's uh, time to open up for questions. Um, if you have a question, ma'am, please, if, if I can ask you to go to the microphones and and also, if the other people can start lining up behind, that will save some time. Uh, thank you. Hi, thank you. Uh, Sandra Baer with Personal Cities. I'm really um, interested. I didn't get to hear all of the keynote, unfortunately. But I'm really interested in this idea about the ability of cities to handle migration, uh, much more to the, f to the facts of infrastructure, water, transport, housing, data, uh, you know, not the least of which is climate change in general. Cities cannot, cities in many nations in, in the African continent, in South America, cannot handle this migration and the increasing population growth. So I wonder what research is being done about that 
whether it improves income or not is almost, uh, you know, who's designing the new way for cities to be to be structured and implemented, and who's who's working on that 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 can own this sort of big question about global urbanization? Thank you. We'll we'll take three questions and then uh, pull them together. Thanks. Yes. Hi, Angela Pashayan from um, Howard University. Um, Mine is kind of twofold, so you can count it as two or one or whatever. Uh, one of the questions is for Ingrid because you specialize in U.S., right? Um, so there's this this thing that I'm, I guess you guys have heard about it, uh, October 2020, where we suddenly have to have a star on our the right-hand corner of our driver's license, or we are not able to get on a plane unless we have a passport. Uh, in other words, a higher form of identification. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are about that. Um, some people don't have passports or can't afford passports. Um, the mad rush for everybody to go and get a star in the right-hand corner of their driver's license and what that's going to do to mobility. Um, I'm just going to leave it at that. I'm not going to throw the other question in there. Hi, um, Ann Miller from George Mason. Mine um, had to do with Leah's talk. I am not an expert in this area, but I've heard of various resettlement programs of homeless people, say to the West Coast and to Hawaii, for example, warmer areas. Um, so I was curious if you're aware of any research in this area and what that, those kinds of programs, the consequences for that would have on the solutions that you proposed. Thank you. Okay, before you, um, you answer those, there are some online questions as well, and I'm just going to pick one of the three for now for Sumila. It's a question directed at Sumila. You mentioned political decentralization has worked to benefit, to benefit local population at the expense of aliens. How do you reconcile this, especially in a multi-ethnic country or region where race relations play a big role? It doesn't say reconcile with what, but anyway. Okay. Um, so I should mention that uh, before the Great Black Migration, of course, U.S. cities were absorbing millions of migrants from Europe, um, it, uh, starting in around 1850, but picking up in the 1880s and uh, through until the U.S. border closed in the 1920s. Um, and uh, those migrants were 35 million in number. Some of them went to rural areas, but many of them settled in the big US cities. And it was exactly during that period that um, cities were investing in the clean water and sewerage technology that we have today. Um, sometimes when a water main breaks, we realize that that water main was 100 years old and it was exactly being put in place during this period. Um, in addition, a lot of our transportation infrastructure, our metros and so on, were being built during that time. Um, and so um, a really interesting question is, how was it that such infrastructure could be built at reasonable cost, whereas today it seems prohibitive to do so? Um, and there's a, a new uh, paper by Leah Brooks uh, and co-author about uh, exactly that question. Um, um, thinking about building uh, a mile of U.S. highway and why it's so much more expensive today than in the past. Um, and so I uh, completely agree with the first question that cities will need to do an, a, a host of uh, public health investments, but um, history suggests that it's possible, and then the question is learning more about um, w when it's uh, cost effective and what kinds of uh, lessons we can draw from that period. Um, I'll uh, stop here to see if others want to weigh in on, on that question or other questions. Um, sure. Uh, although I, I will be honest that I haven't followed fully the, so I'm not sure I'm going to give um, fair weight to both sides of the argument, but I, but I think that certainly in this context, I think that adding barriers to mobility is, is um, potentially concerning, right? It's, again, we talked about that it may be not, not all mobility is, is, um, is necessarily good, but on the other hand, I think that, that adding the kind of barriers, it's a reverse nudge, right? It's a nudge to stay in place, which we think probably is, is from an economic standpoint, is not going to be optimal. Um, 
Thank you. I just want to build on this uh, question of ability of cities to handle migration. So I think in Leah's presentation, what I was very struck by was she asks, what is it that we can do or policymakers can do to make this internal migration happen? And what I was thinking is that in most developing countries, uh, for the most part, policymakers are like, how do we make people just stay put because our cities are getting too congested and too overcrowded? And I understand in the opening panel, one of the, I wasn't there, but um, uh, also mentioned that uh, for the longest time, the idea is has been, how do you invest in rural areas to prevent them from migrating to urban areas? So uh, first, they had deliberately tried to do this. Uh, second. Uh, Today, I think people understand that they are not about to stem this flow. So they are talking about how to handle the increased demand on housing and services and things like that. But for, at the moment, there is nobody planning this sufficiently. So we are basically chasing a stock problem. So whatever we have today in terms of people and infrastructure demands, we are not even able to keep up with those and close that barrier, let alone plan for the incoming or the forthcoming wave of migrants. And this is especially true in South, uh, South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. So the stock gap is very large in serving the existing uh, congested cities uh, with services and things like that. And it's going to get much worse. And that also connects a little bit to the environmental question that has come up a couple of times. On the one hand, environmental issues are creating a push. So when there is severe droughts and floods, or uh, increased salinity of sto soils in certain parts of the country and things like that. Uh, agricultural incomes get hurt and people try to move. But at the same time, we have cities that are under deluge. So uh, we are about to go to Chennai the week after next because they have a massive drought underway. And two years ago, they had a massive flood where lots of lives were lost. So whether it's cities or uh, rural areas, they are struggling to cope, not just with the people onslaught, but also the climate onslaught. And I think um, it's not an easy challenge, which is why uh, there are no easy answers, but <laughs> we are working on it. There, I, I guess maybe China may be the only one that is um, uh, planning oriented enough to plan for some of these things. And they may not get everything right, but they're trying. And a whole lot of other countries are just struggling. There's just uh, no conception of how to cope with that mass that's coming. And I, uh I would like to, to answer also related to the first question to underscore two aspects of migration that I think should be uh, kept present. One is that migrants might not be migrants forever. Like we have seen many migrants as transient migrants. They, they go to one place, they stay there, and they might come back or continue to another place. And that's something to keep in mind when we think about cities, that perhaps we do not need to build um, permanent housing or like housing arrangements for all of them or infrastructure because, for example, in the case of Latin America, we have seen uh, people from Venezuela moving th from one country to the other. And it's unclear, not only for, for the recipients, but also for those who are migrating, if that's going to be their final location or if they intend to come back. And, and that's something that calls for flexibility more than for building something structured. And the other thing that migrants do keep connections to their or places of origin. And for example, again, in Latin America, the, the money flows that are coming from the new places where migrants go to their original places, it's a, it's a force in the economy. And that has also need to be recognized. So I think that it calls for a much more integral view of what being a migrant means. Thanks very much. Now, uh, there are more questions in the audience. There were some excellent questions here that came online, but if economists don't respect budget constraints, then no one will, right? Yeah. So please join me in thanking Leah and the three great panelists for an excellent session. <laughs>